Welcome back to the video lecture series for Introduction to the Art of Programming Using Scala. We close out chapter six in our, look, in our first look at recursion, basic recursion, uh, by looking at another construct in Scala called try-catch. And try-catch is the primary way of dealing with error handling. Now there are details of try-catch that we're not going to go into here, but there are times when you might want to be able to handle simple errors and so it's worth seeing how you can do this uh, early on. So to illustrate this, um, let's run our factorial. And it says enter a number. Well, what happens if I mess up? What happens if I enter something that is not a number? And in this case, by a number, it also meant an integer if I had said 3.5. Uh, we would have also potentially had a problem. What is this going to do? Well, we've seen what this does before. It prints out a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, now, the thing is, there is a lot of meaning in this stuff, and it's worth uh, learning how to read it. And in particular, we're going to look at the first line that it prints out. It says that there is a number format exception, and it was for the input string ABC this thing number format exception exceptions are what happen uh, what happens when errors occur uh, and in this case the type of exception is the number format type which makes sense ABC is not an int and so when it tried to convert ABC to an int it had a problem with it now what's below here is what's called a stack trace and it tells us things about where this was running in the code um, we were inside of you know, this method, which was called by this method, which was called by this method, which was called by this method. And a lot of these things you're like, I have no idea what any of these methods are. Indeed, turns out that you have to get all the way down to here before you get into our file. So at the end of this, it's showing you which file. Most of these are inside of either Java files that were part of the standard Java libraries or Scala files that are part of the Scala libraries we were working on factorial. So line 20 in factorial.scala had this error, and that's the place where we say read int. So what I want to do here is see how we could prevent this, how we could make it so that instead of printing out all of this, uh, maybe just make it so it has a nice default value. Uh, that's, that's probably sufficiently complex for us at this point. So let's go into our factorial program, and if we go to line 20, remember you can jump to a line by typing colon and the line number you want to jump to. This was the problem right here. It said read int, and I typed in something that wasn't an int, and so it threw that exception. Um, and that is the terminology that is typically used. We'll learn later on how we can throw our own exceptions. But all we're worried about now is dealing with exceptions that are thrown in other parts of code. So how do we do that? So it turns out the readint has the possibility for things to go wrong. And in some ways, it's things that go wrong beyond the control of the programmer. Okay, Things that go wrong that are where the programmer messed stuff up, well, that's a bug and it needs to be fixed. When things go wrong because the user input the wrong thing, it is generally not considered appropriate to kill the entire program. Uh, users get very angry when you do that. So you should probably look for ways to do this better. And the way we do this is with the try catch. So to start off, I'm going to just surround this code inside of a try block. Okay, now what is a try block? In some ways the name tells you what it's what it's doing. This right here says I'm going to try to do this code. Now, why did I include the print line inside of here as well? Well, if I didn't, remember when you declare a variable, it only lives until the end of its current block, which would mean that this n would cease to exist right here, and when we try to use it down here, we'd have a problem with that. So we need to have, if we're going to declare this variable n inside of here, we need to have it encompass the whole thing. 
uh, we'll look at, I will rewrite this probably three different times to, to make it do slightly different things. Um, but here, now what, what, so this says, I'm gonna try to run this code, and if something goes wrong, if it throws an exception, well, if someone throws something at you, you, okay, you might duck. Hopefully you try to catch it. And that's what, if we have the ability to handle this, we're going to put in a catch. And so the catch block actually is full of cases. So just like the cases that we saw in the last video for our match and the patterns, I want to do the exact same thing here. I'm going to make a variable name called ex, short for exception. And I only care if it's a number format exception. Other things might possibly go wrong too. You know, they could be big things or whatnot. I don't want to handle those in the same way. I only want to handle number format exceptions in this way. Um, and so I'll put out, you know, have it print out some witty remark about the fact that what they entered was not a number. And now if we come over here and we run this, when we run it this time, if I enter ABC, it doesn't crash. It says, I said a number. Um, now, of course, this might confuse the user if I entered something that is definitely a number. It's just not an int. And that would, we could fix that. We need a, a better prompt for that. So in this particular program, that almost looks uh, like an ideal behavior. This probably is the ideal way to, to, to deal with this. If you had a larger program where you were asking for ints a lot and there was a reasonable default value. So the thing here is that there is no default value. If, if they enter something that's not an int, we don't want to print out you know, this factorial for something. We just want to say, hey, that wasn't a number. Um, what we could do is to change this up, actually, an, an interesting thing to note is that our factorial is really, the way we've written it, is not well-defined for negative values. Um, maybe we want to have it so that this, let's enter a, uh, a non-negative integer as opposed to number. So now this is more specific, and that really is what they should be entering for, for this to work. In that case, non-negative integer. In that case, this should happen either, you know, possibly they enter a double or if they enter negative 99, okay, because we didn't set up our factorial. And in this case, our factorial, well, this factorial is actually going to crash if, if they do that, because this factorial does not handle it. If I use the regular factorial instead of factorial m, it would handle it. But in this case, actually, that's worth looking at. What happens if we run this and I type in minus 99? I don't give it the non-negative integer. Ooh, boy, that was fun. The lots of printouts, the error again. And it's, in this case, it is a very long set of printouts. Let's see if I can grab hold of this. I can scroll all the way up. And you don't even notice anything different. It's because line 16, which is this line, is calling line is is calling this function, which goes to line 16, which calls this function, which goes to line 16. Boom, 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 boom. And that's because with negative 99, this counts down to negative 100, and then negative 101, and negative 102, which is not getting us nicely to zero. Uh, this one wouldn't have had the problem because we broke out any time when n was not greater than one. Uh, the match statement didn't uh, didn't give us quite that flexibility in here, but it's really great for demonstrating this particular error. So what I could do is I could have a function read int with default. Now, the idea here is 
I want to, this function is supposed to call readint and it's supposed to give you back the int. But if they type in something that is not a valid int, instead of crashing the program, it is supposed to return some default value. And so the way we can do this here, and in fact, I will, instead of putting in these curly braces, I'm actually going to make the whole thing a try and a catch. Because it turns out that try catch, just like almost everything in Scala, can, is not only usable as a statement, like I did down here, it's also usable as an expression. Try catch gives you back a value. So if I put a try there and a catch down here, the entire return value of this function comes from those. And so one branch is just read int. Okay? We're going to try to do a read int. If it works, we give back that int. What do we give back if it doesn't work? Well, in the case of our number format exception, I want to give back default. I have to admit, as I'm typing this, I have a slight worry that default is a reserved word in Scala. Um, we'll find out when I try to compile this. Now, if I was going to utilize that down here, instead of doing val n equals readint, I would say val n equals readint with default of how about negative 1. And now I'm going to have an if because I only want to accept non-negative integers. So as long as n is greater than or equal to 0, I want to do this print statement. Else, no case here, we print out our error message. Okay. The advantage of having this as a function here is that this one function now has the try and the catch in it and as long as we're reading ints and we want to have some default we could use this function multiple times and I wouldn't have to keep writing try and catch and try and catch all over the place. Let's see if we did that nicely. Okay, so now if I type in negative 99 we get an error message. If I type in ABC we get an error message. If I type in 4.7 we get an error message but a good one. And if I type in 5, I get 120. Okay, so, or if I type in 5,000, I get a really big number. Okay, so, so this shows you how we can use try catch. We've we used it both as a statement to do things and do something different when there is an error, and also how it can be used as an expression so that it gives us back a value. Uh, as with what we saw last video, because there are two possibilities here, things can go weird if you don't give back the same type. Uh, so if this gave back an int and this gave back a string, this would wind up not matching our thing that says that it's an int. In fact, that's here just to quickly show you the error because this is something that students run into occasionally. If I had made this a string through whatever way, not necessarily to string, we get an error, and the error here is because it, as it says, error type mismatch found string required int. And you might wonder, well, why did it require int? It required int because we told it to do an int. This also is a good example of why you, it is good to put in the return types. What if we didn't have that there? What happens? Still get an error, but now the error is a lot harder to understand. It happens in line 27. Let's go to line 27. That's way down here. Okay. And the error message says value greater than or equal to is not a member of any. And you might be confused. You might say, well, where did any come into this? And you saw last time what any means. Uh, an any is a type that can represent any type. So, but the question is, what is the any? Well, it's the n that's the any. And then you have to ask the question, well, why is n an any? Well, because this try, the try branch gave you an int, and the catch branch gave you a string. And it had, in order to make it so uh, there was a type where both of those work, it has to pick any. Now, of course, if I didn't have this as a string, it turns out the code works. Okay, But it 
the reason for explicitly putting in this int here is because I know I want this function to return an int, and by leaving it out, I set up the possibility for having weird error messages in other parts of the code. Um, <clears throat> Scala will figure out a type, <clears throat> and if we do everything correctly, the type that it figures out will be the type that we want. But it's good to specify the type just to cover our bases and make sure that Scala figures out the type that we think it should. Because if Scala figures out something different than what we think it should be, generally that means that we've messed something up. So that's it for uh, this particular video. We've now finished with chapter six and recursion. Uh, and you know how to do, we've now combined the function calling with conditionals to be able to repeat stuff. And we've seen how we can also do conditional execution with a match and get patterns, how we can do calculations with this. Um, we have quite a bit of, of capability. There's one very significant thing that we are missing the ability to do, though, and that is to read a lot of values and remember them. Okay? With our recursive functions, we read a lot of values and we were able to do operations on them. It was possible to, for example, average 100,000 numbers without too much difficulty but what if we wanted to do both an average and a standard deviation from for those hundred thousand numbers well that would require remembering them and that's what we can't do yet and so in the next chapter we'll come back and we'll add that type of capability